make sure I can share. Oh, um, let me make sure I'm sharing the, the screen that I want to share. I love that the start, the start of this recording is going to be me fiddling with technology. That seems, <laughs> stra seems strangely appropriate. Um, hold on just a moment. Okay, I think we got that. Yay, there we go. Um, well, hey everyone. Uh, so uh, welcome to uh, Art and Observation with a Microscope. Um, my name is uh, Matt Rossi. It's, it's interesting to introduce myself to a room of people who I know quite well. Um, but uh, just to give you a little bit of a sense of who I am uh, and uh, sort of what my interest in the Foldscope has been. Um, I'm a writer and as I, as I said in my introduction, I'm a, um, I'm a, a occasional visual artist. Uh, who has uh, you know has a strong interest in uh, in nature and in uh, the environment? Um, I am not a scientist, um, at least in this. Uh, by which I mean that I am not professionally uh, paid to do science. Um, I do uh, spend an enormous amount of my time trying to uh, trying to sort of uh, figure out the lives of creatures much smaller than me and posing hypotheses about why they do the things they do. Um, I'm sure that by, by many scientific measures, the things that the, the theories that I pose are not uh, are not valid, but uh, but they're definitely it's definitely a large part of what I do. Um, so as a writer and an artist, though, um, because I'm not a scientist, when I started using a fold scope, and I've been using a fold scope for probably I'd say about five years now, um, if maybe a little bit more than that. Um, people people kept asking me uh, sort of what was with all of the microscopic photography I was suddenly posting to, you know, to my uh, Facebook feed, um, you know, and I had a really hard time answering that question um, at first, mostly because, you know, the best I could come up with was, I don't know, because it's cool. Um, uh, so these are a couple of the images. Um, and also, uh, also uh, if you do want to follow me, sorry, this is a little bit of a backtrack, but if you want to follow me, my, um, my Instagram is uh, BK Naturalist uh, on Instagram, if you don't already know that. Um, so one of the things that I realized, uh, so writing is a, is a powerful tool for discovery um, in much the same way as, uh, as science is. Um, and so uh, one of the things I sort of discovered as I wrote about it was that uh, a lot of what I was interested in in the fold scope um, was finding new ways to see the same things, um, you know, to see things that I, I uh, had seen every day. Um, early on in my time working with Foldscope, I was writing quite a bit for uh, for the Microcosmos site and taking photographs and putting putting blog posts up there. And a lot of what I was writing about were um, were uh, things like uh, fruit flies, which I would find in my apartment in Brooklyn. Um, and I raised a bunch of fruit flies, and it changed my entire perspective about my apartment because it suddenly made me realize that my apartment was not just mine. It was not just my space. It was, in fact, this other space, this, this, this space that belonged to a lot of other creatures um, that I was co cohabitating with. And I, had never, I never would have noticed them before if I had not gone through their life cycle with them. Um, so one of the things I found was that uh, the fold scope was actually a really good, good tool for changing the way that I perceived the world around me. Um, and I, I think my favorite example of this is, um, is this butterfly. Um, which I, I, I when I, uh, I hadn't anticipated being able to actually ask this question, but does anybody know what kind of butterfly this is? Um, if anyone out there is shouting to yourself, it is a black swallowtail, give yourself a gold star. Um, this is a black swallowtail butterfly, um, which if you live in the, uh, if you live in the United States, um, or if you live uh, anywhere really in North America, you have seen this kind of butterfly um, flying around somewhere, uh, somewhere at some point, probably in a field full of, uh, you know, Queen Anne's lace, or uh, you know, possibly, um, possibly laying its eggs on your, um, on your parsley. Uh, so this kind of butterfly is common; they're they're everywhere. And I think if you were to normally ask a person to draw this kind of butterfly, you would get an image that looks just like this. Um, but if you take this butterfly and put it under a fold scope, um, you get this entirely new form. Uh, you have this entirely new way of looking at the creature. Um, it becomes this, this uh, series of tessellations, the shapes, the colors, the textures, all of these things change. Um, this is still a picture of a butterfly. So if we were going to talk about 
you know, what is this a photograph of? This is a photograph of the butterfly's wing, but it's taken at such a great magnification that we have to see it differently. We have to see it as something, something else. And that means that we can interpret it as something else. We can actually look at the butterfly and change the way we think about it. So this gets me to sort of the elements of, uh, of, of art um, that I like to think about, uh, you know, that I like to think about with this butterfly and, and with really with what, I, what I'm working on. Those, those basic really, really simple elements of art um, are color, line, shape and form, space and texture. Um, and in terms of thinking about how the, the fold scope works or how the fold scope works towards, uh, towards uh, being an instrument of art, uh, I wanted to think about how the fold scope changes these, uh, these elements uh, of the world around us. I should note that, um, I should note a couple of things. One is that all of the photographs that you're going to see are um, photographs taken uh, through my fold scope. Um, they are photographs taken through a variety of different kinds of fold scopes. Uh, the two that I use most often are actually the beta versions um, that, uh, that I started with. Um, and also I frequently take photographs through this, uh, which is the, um, which is the sort of hand lens that is, uh, that, that fold scope produces. The reason I love using the fold scope as a part of this, um, is that the fold scope, one of the things I really like about it from an artistic perspective is that it's really hackable. Um, and so, uh, because it's a piece of paper, essentially, you can kind of like take it apart, rearrange it, do many different things with it. And it turns it into a kind of a, a different form, uh, multiple times. And so one of the things I really like about it. Uh, is that it's very hackable. My camera is uh, is a simple smartphone camera. Um, I'm not going to give money to any particular company uh, by you know uh, by by saying which brand, but um, but it's just a simple smartphone camera. So uh, it's not specialized equipment, with the exception of the fold scope. So those elements of art to to backtrack: color, line, shape, and form, space, and texture. Um, space, I think, is one of. I just wanted to say that you might be the only one I know who's actively still using the original fold scope. There are very few of them around now. Oh, really? So that's, I have. That's really a heartwarming <laughs> thing to actually see. <laughs> they're. Uh, I, I have to say, they're really like they're uh, they're like fold scope classic. You know, they're. Uh... They are, but the fact that it's been six years or something <laughs> or more, and you have yeah. Anyway, it makes yeah. me happy. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to show them to my students too every now and again. Whenever I have my students, you know, think about think about designing something new, I like to say, "This is a paper microscope. Check this out." Um, so, in terms of thinking about these things, space, I think, is one of the easiest, uh, you know, one of the easiest to sort of conceive of in terms of what changes through a fold scope, because of course, what you're doing is you're narrowing space, um, you're, or or or, ex or expanding, depend, you know, magnifying, depending on how you think about it, but. A couple of other things change in really dramatic ways when you start looking at things through a fold scope. One is that you start to see bright colors in surprising places. Um, you start to see that uh, abstract uh, forms uh, appear. Um, you start to see that lines become sharp uh, or change in really interesting ways. Um, and you also start to see really new compositions that you wouldn't other think, uh, otherwise think about. Um, to start with these two, uh, these two photographs down here, uh, the one on the left is a picture of, I think it was a blob of algae. I'm not even sure I could identify the species for you. Um, but, uh, but that blob of algae, if you were to look at it normally, you know, through, through your, your own eyes, would appear to, in fact, just be a big green blob. Um, under the fold scope and under the microscope, what you see is, of course, that it, it's not just a blob. It's structure and form. It has this really wonderful radial symmetry to it. It has this layout uh, and this color that is both, uh, both really dramatic and also uh, varied in a way that you wouldn't see with your eye. And on the right is a minnow egg. Um, photographed uh, many years ago, um, many years ago when I first started it, one of the first things I ever photographed with a fold scope. Uh, and this minnow egg is a, um, you can see if you, if you just saw it normally, it would be a little round ball, about the size of a, uh, maybe about the size of a, a pinhead. Um, so under the fold scope, it, it magnifies dramatically into these really interesting textures and, and arrangements of shape. So talking about color, um, Color becomes really vivid to me under the fold scope in really interesting ways. And one of the things that I find really interesting about color is contemplating uh, where color arrives from. Um, so each of these are photographs of a kind of creature called a stentor. Um, stentors are, uh, stentors, uh, I think the one on the left is a stentor corellius is, uh, is I think the name of it. Um, the other one, I don't quite know its species, um, but they're, 
the stentor is this really interesting creature because they're sort of uh, they're sort of single cellular uh, they're sort of single single cellular monsters. They're visible to the naked eye. Um, if you were to see them in a pond, they would look like a big uh, sort of a tiny little blob uh, swimming around in the pond. Uh, which is in fact why I first started looking at them because I saw a tiny little blob floating around in some pond water and I went, hmm, what's that? Um, but the thing that I think is really interesting about them is that color in these creatures comes from really dramatic, uh, really dramatic places. Again, the one on the left, if you look at it um, with your naked eye, is really just a, a, dark, a dark blob. Uh, but when you when you look at it close up, you see the way that uh, the way that color plays across uh, plays across its entire body in gradation. You see the way that uh, you can see the way that um, the way that it uh, that it moves in, ter in terms of creating texture uh, throughout the body. Um, stentors are really interesting because they have multiple nuclei. So unlike many other creatures, um, they have uh, uh, unlike a lot of other creatures uh, which have single um, single nuclei. Um, stentors have um, stentors have like a lot of them in a big string throughout them, and you can actually kind of see the jeweled nuclei running through it. But the other thing that I think is really interesting is where color comes from in these creatures, which is that uh, they come from symbiosis. Uh, so thinking about where the actual color comes from, there's an actual a sort of uh, drama to how color forms in the stentor uh, in the stentor's body. Uh, the blue green of the one on the left is because it has absorbed blue green algae, a kind of bacteria, into itself. And the one on the left is this bright speckled green because it has absorbed, of course, a standard green algae into it. Um, and both of them actually use that as a secondary food source when they can't, they can't find anything to hunt. They are, in fact, really dramatic hunters. And I have seen them, I have seen them wipe out the population of a, of a sample of pond water pretty quickly. Shape is another one that uh, is another one that I always find really impressive with how it uh, how it changes. Um, these two images are again uh, one on the the one on the left is um, the I think it's the leftover skin of a of an insect of some sort. I didn't catch it in time to catch what species of insect it was, but it was something tiny. Um, and the one on the right is uh, a swarm of uh, a swarm of a very tiny algae called a microcystis. Um, I think it's a microcystis. Um, and people are welcome to correct me if I'm wrong about this. Cool. Yeah. Oh, good. Get the thumbs up from Manu. Um, so uh, the uh, I've been around a little bit. Uh, so um, yeah. So one of the things I think is really interesting is again neither of these would have been uh, would have looked all that interesting. But when you put them under the fold scope, you get this really interesting abstract composition to them. Um, I can't help but think uh, when I look at the one on the left of uh, of um, several. Um, when I look at the one on the left, I can't help but think of several. Um, uh, of several um, pieces by Picasso in some of his later periods, some of his very, very cubist periods with all of the heavy lines and the, uh, the really sort of focus on dark, um, dark browns. And on the, the one on the right, the microcystis, I always think of it as looking almost like someone had photographed a, um, someone had photographed a, uh, um, it almost makes me look like someone had photographed uh, um, a, um, a Brancusi. Uh, you know, a painting by Baron, or sculpture by Brancusi, um, and so uh, and so I find that that's uh, I find that that's pretty pretty fascinating. Um, and so what a, point being, of course, that the that the oh, sorry I'm getting distracted by chats. Point being that of course that the um, that the 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 dramatic shape here really comes from having looked at this up close. So you suddenly again neither of these things would have looked like much, um, but you really get these really fun, interesting abstract compositions and forms. Lines also change uh, change in interesting ways. So I think when artists talk about line, they're talking a lot about um, a lot about how uh, how different lines across a different uh, how how different lines across different um, uh, systems um, how they change uh, how how different lines across different systems uh, or just different compositions change the kind of feeling that you get from it. Um, and I I think that uh, I think that for me the uh, these two compositions really demonstrate interestingly how um, how the fold scope can be used, uh, or how how when you look at creatures very close up, you actually see there's a there's an interesting kind of composition or an interesting sort of a kind of beauty to them um, that uh, doesn't doesn't necessarily appear um, immediately to the naked eye. Uh, the left uh, on the left is an image of an amphipod. Um, again, it, along with the uh, minnow, it was one of the first images I took with a microscope. Um, 
it, uh, it, it, um, like, you know, caught it in a bunch of, in a bunch of seawater just outside of, uh, outside of New Jersey. Um, and it looks like a little white blob, you know, little white speck in the water, um, when you look at it normally, but under here, there's this beautifully etched quality to it. It almost looks like something that you would find, I think, uh, etched into the wall of a cave somewhere. You know, it's something, something laid out, um, and this really dramatic, and, and I think in, in many ways, it's very, um, this very, you know, yeah, this very dramatic and very primal uh, sort of urge towards towards what we what we would represent uh, life as. Um, whereas the one on the the right is um, is the larva of a non-biting midge. Um, it uh, it is recognizable as that uh, to the naked eye. This is a macro invertebrate, so you're able to see it with your naked eye pretty pretty easily. Um, but up close, one of the things that I I was struck by when I took this photograph was um, there's an almost uh, Art Deco quality to the way that the that the midge has organized itself. You can see how artistic movements reflect natural, uh, you know, natural movements and natural lines. To me, this there's an almost gothic, almost Art Deco quality to this midge. Um, it this is this is very anthropomorphizing, but it almost looks like it's wearing a fancy tuxedo, um, you know, and 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 out uh, and out for uh, for a night on the town. Um, and so I, I find that the, that the way that those lines, uh, the way that those lines, those organic forms, those shapes, um, say something about the creatures themselves, even if those things aren't uh, you know, specifically accurate to science, as, an, as a way of thinking about them, uh, they engender a kind, of, a kind of new understanding and a new empathy that I, I have for the natural world. So then putting them all together. Um, so when I when I find myself composing these, I find myself looking for um, for the ways in which these uh, the ways in which these different forms will be um, will play off of each other. Uh, so one of the things I'm oftentimes looking for is, of course, where do they occupy the space most interestingly? What are the parts of it that I think are the most beautiful, uh, the most beautiful, or the most surprising? Um, what has grabbed my attention the most is something that I'm oftentimes looking for. So uh, the piece on the left, the, the far left piece, um, this is a piece of algae with three diatoms growing off of it. And I remember when I was looking at it thinking I was photographing the algae. One of the first thoughts I had was that I was photographing the algae. But it was very clear that the diatoms were the most interesting visual aspect of it. And so when I framed the photograph, um, these are the three diatoms, which again look very much like Frank Cusey's bird in flight to me. Um, they, uh, when I was framing these diatoms, um, or this, this image, I made it so that the, uh, that the diatoms are in the very center of the, of the image. They're where the eye goes to first. And the, the actual algae cuts across the page, uh, sort of down and to the left. My goal with this was to, was to try to, try to really emphasize, um, the delicacy of the, of the diatom, uh, against the sort of like the, the line of the, uh, of the, the algae there and, and have it cut there. Um, in the middle here, uh, the, this photograph has long been a fav favorite of mine. Um, it is the mouth parts of a uh, kind of uh, kind of aquatic worm called a polychaete worm. Um, they are uh, very very present in the East River in Brooklyn, where I used to live and where I used to catch a lot of my creatures. Um, and the polychaetes uh, have these really wonderful vivid mouth parts. Um, this one was actually a still taken from a video, so uh, I didn't catch it exactly. Uh, I didn't catch it exactly um, as is. What I had to do is I actually had to video the whole thing, and then at one point I cut out a still frame from it. But the reason I chose this still over others um, and cropped it down to just focus on focus on the sort of central um, the sort of central mouth parts um, was that I love the way that the color, uh, the sort of darkened color of the worm's body, uh, gives way to these really light very rosy beautiful pinks uh with the uh with the the actual tendrils sort of flowing around themselves there's a really nice combination of line and movement um and a, and a way that uh, I, I really i don't know found it very evocative um there's something sort of monstrous about the polychaete worm of course anything that is a worm is going to feel sort of monstrous to, to human beings um but i also think that they are really interesting creatures they're surprisingly one of the things I, I discovered in, in ages of watching with them was that they actually protect their young very, uh, very lovingly. They, they fold their bodies around their egg sacs and carry them around, um, which was something I wasn't expecting from them. And then, of course, the third here is, is visibly a snail shell. So there's no surprise in terms of what it is. But one of the things that stood out for me is the snail shell itself was quite tiny. It was about the size of the head of a pin. 
And of course, you can see the way that the organic lines uh, of the sort of standard spiral of a, of a snail shell uh, play against the, the, the more rigid lines of the, of the ridges across the shell, play with the, the way that the snail's body sort of, uh, this, the snail was a, was a, a little bit um, damaged, um, whether by my own actions or, or by its, its life, I don't know. Um, but you can see the way that the softness of the body and the hardness of the shell uh, create an interesting contrast. And then, of course, the, the, one of the things that is an ever an ever present part about light microscopy, um, especially backlit, is that light that you get from the back. And you can actually play around with different light sources um, as a way of creating different effects. So I, my most co I'll talk about this in a second, but my, my most common light source is an LED. Um, but you can actually play around with various softnesses of light or hardnesses of light, lenses on the light, um, angles of light to create different effects in the, uh, in the, in the light. This is a, one final composition. This is also one of my favorites, and I included it because I uh, took this photograph many years ago, um, doing a, uh, about four years ago, doing a bio blitz with, uh, with uh, the Foldscope crew in Washington, DC. Um, and this was taken, this is a strand of a kind of algae called Spirogyra. Um, I remember taking this photograph. Uh, be, uh, I remember taking this photograph um, because uh, I was just stunned by how um, just stunned by how a few filaments of algae could contain so many multitudes of form and uh, this this really nice dramatic line cutting across. Um, in my attempts to create uh, new pieces of art out of this, I've actually um, I've actually attempted to recreate this piece, and I've never managed to catch something. I think quite as perfect as the way that nature set it up itself. So, as I said before, as a, as a an artist and a writer, um, one of the things I'm always focusing on is uh, is learning to see things in a new way. I think that one of the big differences between the scientist and the artist is that while we're both really centered on uh, on seeing and really centered on being able to to view the world. Um, I think uh, a scientist there, and uh, I'm I loath to say what scientists do in a room full of scientists, but the scientists will uh, will I think aim for analysis of the things so that there can be a greater interpret uh, a greater understanding, and the artist aims for interpretation of the uh, of the object so that there can be a greater understanding. And analysis and interpretation are not opposing forces by any stretch of the imagination, but I do think that they are, they're different and they're, they serve different purposes. So one of the things I'm, I'm looking for as I, as I take photographs are questions of how can I emphasize beauty? How can I change, uh, how can I change it and emphasize one thing versus another? And how can I interpret what I'm actually seeing? This is a, an early experiment of mine with a lino cut, um, which is if you're, if you're uh, not familiar is a printing technique where uh, where you lay out an image and then carve a block of linoleum um, and then you lay the ink out on it and you print it from there. Um, and on the very far left is the original image that I took using the fold scope. Um, this is a bug. I have no idea what sort of insect it is. Um, I, uh, I have no idea precisely what sort of insect it is. It was living on a piece of basil, uh, so I have referred to it regularly as the basil bug. Um, but, uh, but that's probably not its actual name. Um, its actual name was Marty, perhaps. Uh, anyway, so what I attempted to do was uh, with the line of cut was to transfer the image directly onto the block in the middle. And so that, that middle block is, is, is what I carved out. And you can see that already I was taking sort of liberties with interpretation, emphasizing certain parts of it, like its eyes and, um, and the sort of uh, shapes around its middle. Um, and and de-emphasizing you know de-emphasizing other things and of course I was also emphasizing the visual field behind it um, so I, I attempted to uh, create a kind of motion within the visual field behind it to really you know make it into a very dramatic image um, and then when I was printing it I moved uh, I I took a, a multicolor process so this is a three color process using um, it's a three color process it uses uh, it uses um, green, brown, and black to emphasize it, and, and I ran the three of them together. Um, again, this is an early experiment with, uh, with this, but, uh, but you can see the way in which the bug, the, 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 the image comes out stylized. It becomes this, uh, this very different form of, uh, of, the, of the insect, even as it's recognizably the same image. I've taken that um, I've I've taken that that kind of interpretation even farther with other kinds of lino cuts, um, and one of the things that I find is is actually a good way of uh, of thinking about 
how do you interpret an image, uh, a scientific image, is, how, is taking some of those elements of, uh, of the image. Um, so if you, if you were to do this yourself, one of the things I would recommend is, is looking at the image and saying, well, what are the elements that I really want to emphasize most? Um, so for this image here, one of the things I really, the two things that really stood out for me um, on, on the image on the right, um, which was I think just a piece of a leaf, the things that really stood out for me were um, the, the sort of honeycombing and the, and the, the dramatic lines of the, uh, of the cell structure, um, and then that yellowish uh, tinge in the middle. And so in translating it into Linocut, what I did is I really tried, again, you know, you can see I, I tried to emphasize uh, that it was a leaf, so I, I tried to sort of abstract it into a more leaf shape. Um, I attempted to, uh, to, to really dramatically emphasize the, um, the heaviness of the lines. And then in, in the middle, um, as a sort of nod to the medium, I actually used a turmeric-based ink. Um, so I used turmeric and then bound it. Um, I used a, a sort of natural turmeric and then I bound it with um, a mordant called alum um, and, uh, and created an, an ink out of that, a, a little bit of a, a thickener. Uh, to create an ink out of that, um, and then laid that in the middle. So you can see that that yellow is really emphasized, and the uh, and the rest of it is uh, is um, is set behind. Um, that also goes towards the way in which the medium that you can use can be part of you know part of how uh, how you're speaking uh, in in regards to this. Um, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, this is that same uh, minnow egg. So back to sort of figuring out what you want to emphasize. This is that same minnow egg. Uh, from earlier in the in the talk that we saw earlier, um, and one of the things that I did is I stripped out essentially all of the other elements of uh, you know every other element of um, of color that I could think of, um, and really wanted to emphasize the line and the texture of this one. Um, so what I did is I uh, I put it in the photograph into a program which is a program that I use quite a bit. It's a very uh, inexpensive photo program called Affinity. Um, uh, called Affinity Photo. It's not a. It's it's a nice, inexpensive, you know, uh, non Photoshop program. Um, I will throw them some money. Um, the uh, and I used that program to uh, to strip out color from the uh, from the image and then to really emphasize the uh, the contrast. Uh, and what you end up with is this is this very 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 dark, uh, you know, very textural image that again takes that abstract form of the minnow egg and abstracts it even further. So in thinking about ways in which medium has, uh, has been a part of my artistic practice. So thinking about, uh, at, at one point I was thinking about, you know, what I was doing as a, as a, a, a visual artist working with microscopy. Um, and I was thinking about how microscopy could be a, a even larger part of my, uh, of my practice. Um, so one of the things I started playing around with was I, I learned from, uh, from a TED talk of all places that uh, if you make kombucha, the drink kombucha, you end up with, uh, anyone who's ever made kombucha is familiar with this, uh, this which is you end up with a, a skin on the top that kombucha makers call a SCOBY. Um, the, SCOBY is, um, the SCOBY is specifically a, um, oops, sorry. Um, the SCOBY is specifically uh, a, a, a filament uh, created by the bacteria in the, uh, in the kombucha. It's a filament of cellulose. Um, so it is the same composition essentially as, um, as paper. Uh, it's just a, a series of cellulose lines, um, but it's created by the bacteria and it's quite wet. It's very, it's very thick. Um, and what happens is if you dry it, uh, you end up with uh, you end up with something that is very familiar and very similar to skin, and so when I found this out, I thought, well, this is a really interesting this is a really interesting thing I could play around with in my practice. Um, I could play around with uh, using this microbially made skin and a method of tattooing. Um, so you can see on the on the left, this is sort of one of my early attempts at tattooing uh, at tattooing this. Uh, this is you know. I'm, I'm glad I wasn't doing this on a person because they would have been very mad at me. But, um, but uh, I, was, uh, I was using a, a tattoo needle inside of an old pen. Um, and what I did is I, uh, I actually used ink in the SCOBY and, and used a tattooing method of just pecking the, uh, pecking the SCOBY with the tattoo needle as I went to create this image. And so the final image is embedded into the SCOBY and then I wash, uh, I dry the SCOBY, 
I wash off any residual sugars and any residual uh, any residual other things, but the ink remains. Uh, and what you end up with is something that's um, it's it, it has a texture rather rather like parchment. Finally, um, one of the things that I've I've played around with is taking those microscopic images. So one of the things I really like to look at are macro invertebrates. Um, I like looking at macroinvertebrates because you see macroinvertebrates pretty regularly, but you probably don't see them very closely. Um, and so one of the things I've played around with is using photo stitching and a technology called photo uh, called focus stacking. I've had less good luck with photo focus stacking, but this is an image of um, a damselfly nymph. Um, damselflies are, they look like dragonflies, but they're sort of thinner. Um, and they fly around, and their nymphs are are some of the apex predators of the uh, of the macro invertebrate world. They'll walk around uh, like lions in a in a pile of uh, in a pile of algae, um, and so they. Uh, I really I really wanted to take um, some imagery of of one of these nymphs, uh, and I this is composed out of uh, about a dozen still shots taken from a video. So I. What I did is I put the I put the nymph into a slide, uh, a, a scoop slide, so it uh, it had a place to rest um, and it wasn't damaged. And I just took a video scanning its entire body, up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, and then I took each chunk of the, that video and took photographs uh, out of the, that chunk and then reassembled them using Affinity to uh, to create this sort of larger image. And I love the fact that you know it is really just an image of a nymph. Um, but you can see the nervous system. Uh, you can see the, the the entire nervous system laid out. The entire um, the entire venous system. You can see the way that the the creature works both inside and out. And of course, there's something really quite wonderful about that radiant light um, pouring through you know pouring through its body that I think elevates the creature. Um, you know, elevates something that that people might be fascinated by, but elevates it into a, a being of, of some beauty and, and drama. So a few tips, um, and we'll have a little bit of a, of a question and answer and a, a chat, um, I think, once, once I'm done talking. Um, but a few tips for if you, if you want to do this. Um, first off, it's really useful to choose um, relatively still subjects um, if, you're, if you're just starting out. Um, I've, I have had many an afternoon when I first started out trying to photograph something as quick as a copepod, which are these really tiny little crustaceans that move faster than lightning through water. Um, and, uh, and it was, you know, it's a frustrating thing to finally get your shot lined up and your focus, uh, your focus in, and then your subject moves away. So when you first start out, it's not a bad idea um, to choose relatively still subjects. Um, creatures, uh, uh, you can see here, um, the things that I, that I have here, there's a, a piece of, of moss that I pulled up with a little bit of sand still clinging to it. Um, moth wings obviously don't hurt any creatures to do this. That that wouldn't be good. But uh, but if you happen to find uh, if you happen to find uh, someone you know someone no longer uh, alive, feel free to to take some photographs of them. Um, and then of course the one on the, the right is a is actually a sea creature that I found. Um, if you if you're lucky enough to live by the ocean. Um, for starters, congratulations. But uh, if you're lucky enough to live by the ocean, there's a lot of sessile creatures who live attached to docks. Um, oftentimes they look like algae, but they are not. Um, this one on the left is a kind of, uh, is a kind of coral polyp um, that looks like floating algae in the water, but when you get it up close, it, it is, has this beautiful sort of form like a lily. And yeah, and also, um, you know, experiment with different kinds of, uh, a third, it's, it's helpful to have a dedicated light source. Um, I have used over the last few years a few different light sources. Uh, one of them, uh, one of them is just is the uh, is the light that comes with this, um, or or a very simple LED light is very is very good for for a cold scope and will catch it. But I've also experimented with things like LED based. Uh, there's any number of cheap LED based uh, desk lamps that you can clip onto a desk, and then they they have a bendy head, which is important, so you can lay them flat on the desk and oftentimes they have adjustable light uh they have adjustable uh light levels so you can play around with that the other things that i've used as light sources um if i'm out taking field photography um which occasionally i'll, I'll go out in the field and take photography if i'm out there i will take um a, a flashlight with me um we have found uh over many years that oftentimes having a diffuse light 
is a little bit better than having a very, very direct light. So if you do bring a flashlight with you, it's not a bad idea to put a piece of like wax paper over it or something like that. Um, finally, um, finally, the, uh, yeah, it's not a bad idea to have um, a, a bit of wax paper or uh, since wax paper will probably melt, maybe, maybe parchment paper, but something to diffuse the light a little bit is not a terrible idea. And I think people have had good luck with various, um, various things. Um, Finally, uh, or third, experiment with different kinds of media. Um, I, like you, as you've seen, I've played around with pretty much anything I can put color onto um, as a part of this. Things that I didn't show you, I've got several, uh, I've found that gouache is really nice for capturing some of the vivid colors that you get and, the, and some, of the sort of, uh, some of the sort of wash quality of the backgrounds. Uh, gouache is great for that. Um, I've played around with, uh, I've played around with many different media, but to be honest with you, I've also not even like, one of the things I carry with me everywhere is this, uh, this little package of um, colored pencils. Um, it's just a really standard package of colored pencils and I carry it with me pretty much everywhere because this is as good as anything to, uh, to play around with. So if you, if you don't have any sort of, you know, if you don't have anything fancy to make art with, um, my, my great recommendation is to play around with pretty much every kind of media you can. Um, some of them have been more successful than others for me, um, but, um, but yeah. Um, and finally, uh, explore, discover new things. Um, this is really what it's all about for me. And the thing that really, uh, to return to it, the thing that really launched this for me as one of the most uh, extraordinary experiences was having, um, having the experience of picking up a pair in my house that we had from a CSA, looking inside of it, finding a little hole inside of it and going, I wonder what lives there because you know something lives there and then I ended up raising a whole bunch of fruit flies and, and seeing fruit flies grow up because of that um, and while you know and while I didn't share th those particular images they really transformed how I walked around my neighborhood afterwards I, I saw the world in a completely different way and really that's what this is for I've seen people posting things uh, I've seen people post things that were um, that were really remarkable, really remarkable discoveries and really led to some interesting questions just from looking at something and going, that's pretty. I wonder what that looks like up close. And, and sometimes you end up, um, sometimes you end up with really great things. The other, the other side of this is that the other thing that I really like to, to look at occasionally is that's ugly. I wonder what that looks like up close because it's oftentimes really startling how, how the things that you kind of go, Ugh, um, uh, really look beautiful up close. Um, microcystis, that, uh, that Brancusi looking thing is actually pond scum. Uh, so when you scoop it off the top of a pond, it's really just kind of floating there as this, you know, as this pond scum, but it looks quite nice up close. Um, and that's, that's what I have. Do, do people have questions for me? Do, do we want to have a conversation? I think it would be fantastic to just have an open conversation. There are lots of uh, people also ended up joining from an odd hour from India as well. So what I'll do is, if Matt, if you stop sharing your screen, I'll unmute everybody. And then since I'm managing kids, uh, somebody else can manage the who's talking part. Uh, let me just unmute. Uh, and then people can just raise their hands and ask questions. I think this is much more about the community uh, than anything else and just having chance to just see everybody in the community. And again, before uh, we start the Q&A, that was just a fantastic walk through. Uh, <laughs> I kind of feel that uh, I have a better understanding of what goes in your living room now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've tried to limit the quantity of pond scum in our living room, but um, <laughs> but we not to be honest, we have not been successful at that. I think it's fair. Uh, okay. Oh, I and Alice just approved. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's Papa's gonna make. Uh, so I'm just gonna try. So yeah, now, so find. now people should be able to unmute themselves. Okay. Yeah, and then I, this is an open Q and A. Just wait one second. I what can you find? The, the, what can you find? The, um, you have a question the, for Matt? The buttons are. Okay, the buttons for the rocket launch. I'm going to help her find the button for the rocket launch. This is open Q&A, so anybody can ask questions. And you Excellent. can turn your videos on just so Matt can see you. Uh, so yeah, just raise your hand or just ask questions. I think everybody should be able to unmute themselves now as if I've set the settings correct. Um, I, so I see Jan's hand raised uh, first. Uh, Jan. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, Matt, I always have problems with the very simplest um, technologies. Could you show us how the how the microscope goes onto your phone? Is that physical? Yeah, um, it's you know I need to actually get that a little bit set up uh, to do that, but it, it is actually quite simple. Um, oh shoot, I don't think I have. I don't think I have a new version made at the moment. Um, I, uh, so it is actually quite simple the way that that happens. Um, I, d I dismantled my last one because as I mentioned, they're uh, quite hackable. Um, but it, it's, a really very, it's a very simple process. Um, so the microscope, uh, even the new version looks essentially the, same, uh, essentially the same as this. It's a little bit wider and a little bit more open. Um, but uh, all of them have a little bit of a magnetic coupler on them. Um, so, you know, basically the way the microscope goes on is, um, this is a little bit different from how it would normally go. Um, but uh, yeah, so what you do is you take this micro, you take this like this magnetic coupler and you kind of place it over, you place it over the, uh, the camera. And generally what I do is I just kind of tape it on there. Um, I think that the, the newer versions have a sort of sticky tape ring that you can use to put it on. Uh, I generally just put it up on there and then it kind of goes click. Um, and then there's a, a, a period of, um, of a little bit of adjusting that I usually have to go through because um, there's a period of a little bit of adjusting that I usually have to go through just because once it's clicked into place, um, sometimes when you're, when you're actually looking at a slide, it turns out that your, that your camera lens is a little bit off center and you end up with like, you end up with like, you know, total eclipse of the moon coming in. Um, so, uh, I try to try to get it a little bit centered, but basically that's, that's it. It's, it's essentially a magnetic, uh, a magnetic ring that clips to another magnetic ring and then the two of them join together. And then basically your, your cell phone lens and the lens of the, of the, um, of the microscope are, are joined. Um, the other thing you can do if you're not using it with a phone, um, but of course this is about taking photos with it, but if you weren't using it with a phone and just wanted to look through it, um, you can actually just hold it up to your eye like that, and uh, you know, sort of like that, and the light source and, and see it that way, um, which Thank also you. works quite well. Oh, uh, Katie, uh, so Katie asks, uh, if you were to try, oh, this is great. If you were to try to uh, art related, uh, art related to fold scope images with elementary students, uh, which would you try first? Um, I would try personally, um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, I would try to, uh, I think I would try to use plant leaves um, first. Um, one of the things, that, that would be one of the first things that I would do. Because, they're non, because they don't move around very much, plants, plants and possibly, um, if you can get them good and flat, an ant is usually pretty good. Um, but ants usually roam around. But plant leaves are really nice. If you were going to do, uh, so in terms of thinking about the composition, uh, the composition, plants, algae, things like that, um, they don't move uh, and they are oftentimes really surprising. So um, if I were going to do this as a, as a sort of teaching moment with uh, elementary students, I would want to, I think I would want to have both the, the question of like, well, you know, like if we go back to that, um, to that uh, spirogyra off, off in the corner, um, you know, often it's a little slide. There are so many questions that can come from that for an elementary school student of like, what, why is there that pattern? And you know, why, why do we have that spiral pattern working up? Or what are those, what are those green dots? Or what, what are the, what are the squares? And so you have these really interesting shape and color combos. And it's, you, you tend to get a really nice combination of shape and color and line. Um, and even, even something as simple as, you know, even something as simple as, a leaf is going to have a really nice patterning of, of cell structures and the way that uh, any, any venous plant is gonna have interesting sort of veins moving through it and a really nice uh, composition arrangement. Uh, Lax? And I think you can, yeah, I think- Hi you're... Matt, that was, that was wonderful. That was really great. Um, actually, my question is more on lines of perspective that is, um, you know, you showed how you were able to convert what you see into different types of art mediums. And, you know, the way you look at it, you're bringing it out in that medium. I'm sort of curious to know how it has influenced your writing, you know, as such, since I know that you write uh, quite a bit, not only little articles, but you're also a, you know, a 
writer on the side. So how, how has that influenced your thinking and how does it, uh, how could one integrate that writing? into? Well, so I think, um, so one of the things that I've, I've, it has, it has shifted my relationship to, it's, it's dramatically shifted my relationship to nature and to how I think about, um, how I think about different creatures um, and, and their relationship to me. Um, as people, as people who talk to me regularly know, like it, it becomes increasingly common for me to like, to, to want to think from the perspective of, you know, of another creature. And to, uh, one of the things that's shifted for me in my writing is that um, I've stopped using it. I mean, this is a very simple thing. I've stopped using it when I refer to any living thing. Um, any, any creature that is living, if I don't know it's, if I don't know it's uh, uh, gender, um, I'll, uh, which is most of them, I don't know their gender, um, I'll refer to them as they, but, um, but I've, I've stopped referring to living creatures as it. Um, because I've come to realize that they're agented beings with, you know, with lives of their own. Um, and one of the things that has shifted for me is, um, and this is one of those things that I, I will cop to this being, this is like, this is a humanities perspective all the way. But I've also noticed that, um, that they, that they have minds, that they have these apparently, you know, that, that I've, I've started to ascribe a theory of mind to, um, to even, even the really small things, uh, because you watch them behave. And uh, I, I remember early on watching a bacteria run from something and, and thinking to myself, what caused that? If it couldn't, if it couldn't experience fear, if it couldn't experience uh, the sensation of being startled, how did it run? Why did it do anything? Um, and so I started to think, you know, its mind isn't a human mind. It's not, I'm not going to go as far as to say that they're people, they're humans running around, but its mind is a mind. Um, and so I've started to think about, started to think about the, the minds of other creatures and the ways in which they engage in the world in, in, in ways I never would have. Um, and it has shaped how I, it's shaped how I write uh, about them pretty regularly. I wrote, um, I wrote a little while ago, I have a newsletter called Tiny Nature that I put out uh, sporadically. I put it out far less often than I really want, than I really should. But, um, but um, I wrote a little while ago about pests and about the concept of a pest and how, um, how many creatures are, are ascribed to being pests, but really all that word means is we don't want you here. Um, and, and we don't accept that you belong in our house. And I, um, I, I, you know, I think of it as kind of a, 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 a mission of mine to, um, to sort of remove that, that moniker from, from all things. Cause so many, so many of them have, I don't know, they have these really interesting little lives. My partner can, uh, can attest to the, the degree to which like, you know, the question, should we put this spider outside is usually met with, no, this is its home. Um, and very rarely is the answer like, yeah, yeah, we should probably put it outside because usually this is its home, you know, it lives here. So it probably just wants to come back inside um, after that. It's, yeah, so it's changed. It's definitely changed how I think about, how I think about and how I write about other creatures when I'm, when I'm writing about them. Does that answer? Um, Katie, you, uh, Katie followed up uh, with the question of, is there a simple program uh, to, uh, to manipulate digital images? Um, I, I do find that, um, I don't know, I, um, I think that as, a, as an elementary school teacher, you probably know, uh, you probably know the, the, what the students uh, are capable of more than me. Um, most, of, most of the programs that I've been working with are a little bit beyond me. Um, so I definitely have these moments. So if anyone else has a, a pretty nice, simple uh, digital photo manipulation program, um, please feel free to toss it into the chat. Um, personally, uh, I think asking them to work with colored pencils, um, asking them to work with, uh, with crayons and, and, other, and other kinds of drawing that they're familiar with. Um, I, I would even go as far as to say that things like collage are really great. Um, you can probably do things like, you can probably do a simple lino cut with, uh, with, uh, with students um, because like lino cut really just requires something soft that you can cut and some ink um, and potatoes work just as well as linoleum for, for that. So, um, Maybe not just as well, but they work pretty pretty closely to the linoleum for that. So you could do it with you know you could do it with potatoes and uh, potatoes and pretty simple wa you know uh, watercolor depending on the age. I also have no I also have no good bead on on 
uh, what what people of various ages know how to do digitally these days. Um, that, that's, that's just a rule. Um, so yeah. Um, oh yeah, Manu points out that Lapsit is uh, Lapsit is also a really good one for phones. Uh, if you are working on uh, if you are working on um, if you are working on a phone, Lapsit is a really great program for it. Um, I have not had great luck taking, it, it's good for taking time lapses um, of different things. And I have, um, I've never had great luck doing that with a fold scope, um, but I have had really good luck taking, um, I've had really good luck taking photographs with, um, I've had really good luck uh, taking photographs with, uh, with other things. Um, okay, uh, Paul, I think you have your hand up. Paul D'Agostino. Oh, yeah. Max, Hi. Thank, thanks for doing this talk. It's been really great. Um, I really appreciated the question about how some of these things might have affected your writing, obviously, because we share a lot of similar, I don't know, interests, vices, whatever. <laughs> but uh, um, All of the above. Yeah. And, you know, when you kind of have your hands in various practices, you're always thinking a little bit in all of them. And I wondered if you also see text in so many of these images that you're taking, like not only in line quality and sometimes seeing, you know, almost a letter form or something, but seeing the kinds of things that reference text. There was a, an image that you showed that, kind of appeared like a ribbon running horizontally across the screen and you know it, it almost looked like a, a readout of dna you know mm -hmm. like the, the the four dna dots that you'll see lined up in different spots um and it looked like microfish and you know just automatically text really things come to mind and i wonder if that has affected, I mean, even the tattoo thing that you did on the SCOBY is in a way incising into something, uh, a symbol that might also be, you know, a symbol that is referencing a, a thing. So long-winded question, do the text visuals influence you kind of on both fronts? Well, it's interesting too, because I mean, I think one of the things that's really interesting about um, the Spira Gyra is it's, um, I think it's actually even conceivable that, um, and someone who knows, uh, who knows uh, science a little bit better than I do um, can maybe explain this better than I can. Um, but my understanding is that the Spira Gyra, the, that patterning of them does relate to, maybe I'm wrong about this, but does relate to the sort of uh, a, 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 an almost spiral of DNA. Um, that they're the chloroblasts, but they're arranged in a way that uh, they're arranged in a way that that creates a kind of uh, a kind of helix uh, quality. Is that is that correct, or am I incorrect about that? Lax, you know about these things. Yeah, it, 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 no, it, it's DNA is double helical. But um, what oh, okay. happened? What's interesting about uh, Spirogyra is that um, the patterns change depending on the amount of light you provide. Huh. So, you know, the, if you have a light source and then you play around with how much light it gets, these patterns, the tightness of the coil or the, so the sort of the language of uh, you know, compression changes. For the, huh? yeah. But it's some kind of arrangement that, that is optimized along the you know, volume of the cell. Oh, okay. So it's really just, it's a spatial sort of optimization? Yes, yes. Of placement of uh, things for, you know, best photosynthesis um i i think i think to paul to answer your question i don't tend to think of the textiness of it but i do tend to think uh, i think this is a way that uh that uh you and i are and thank you lex for, for for that um i think this is a way that you and i are um you and i are 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 similar but a little bit different is that i do tend to think in terms of the narrative of uh of of the form i do like to think about how about what story is told across across the 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 image and across uh, all of these things i i will say as a sort of a side of um of uh in regard to text one of the things that's um i so i'm i'm you know one of the ways that this has affected my writing is that i'm currently writing something that deals a lot with insects in personal spaces 
and specifically butterflies. Um, and I, um, I, in part of my research for this, I found that there's um, a surprising number of butterflies that are named for the illusion that there is text on their back. Um, there are any, oftentimes that, that, uh, that language is Hebrew. Um, and so there are, um, there are several different varieties of, of butterfly and moth that are named things like the Hebrew moth or the, uh, or the um, I think one of them is named the cetaceous Hebrew character. Um, and it's named this because it apparently, it seems to have a, a, a piece of text in Hebrew across its back that people regularly see. So it is an interesting, it's an interesting thing though, that like, um, people do have a habit of, uh, and I haven't, I haven't fallen into the, that habit, but there's a, a real habit of seeing, uh, uh, seeing a kind of textiness to, uh, to these patterns. And I think that it's because, uh, you know, humans as, as very, uh, as language forming creatures and as pattern, pattern recognizing creatures, when we see things that really are form and are really, that are patterns that are, that are laid out for various, you know, for, for apparent reasons, one of the first things we go to is that must be language, you know, that, that must be, you know, that must be speech of some sort. Um, and, and so we do tend to, uh, we do tend to see those things. Um, Lax, do you have your, uh, do you have your hand up from earlier or did you have another question? I wasn't sure. Perhaps it's from earlier, so I, I guess I have to put my hand down. Yeah, I, I was, I, I'm not familiar with the hand raising interface. Um, okay. Other questions? Oh. Oh yeah, Pia, I absolutely must read. Uh, I, I, um, I'm seeing Pia's uh, suggestion that I should read Defining Agency, Individually, Normativity, Asymmetry, Spatial Temporality, and Action. Um, that sounds right up my alley. <laughs> um, thank you for the recommendation. Can I, can I make one more comment? Of course. Yeah. Always. So uh, I like the idea that you brought about that something that uh, scientists think a lot about is the question of consciousness. That is, uh, you know, when you look at a bacterium, the first question that comes to you when you see it respond is that, is that consciousness? Um, and what is the nature of consciousness then, then, you know? Of course, we know the molecular details about, for example, how the chemoreceptors allow for a bacterium to smell food and go away from it. But, but you know, is, so the basis of consciousness can be looked at from different perspectives. And I like the fact that you're looking at it this way. I mean, when I think about it, I think of it as a molecular perspective. I mean, just a bunch of molecules and diffusion of, con um, of a certain molecule and then response is also entirely molecular in a very uh, sort of mathematical view. But I like the fact that it also brings out this aspect, even if you're not thinking about it in that way, that there is a certain consciousness that everything has. And um, I wonder if you've thought about it a little more. Well, yeah, and I think that this is one of those, um, you know, one of those things that I was talking about earlier when I talked about, you know, maybe the difference between um, an artistic perspective or a humanities perspective and a, a scientific perspective is, is you know, uh, analysis versus interpretation. Um, I think that one of the things that I'm, I'm free to do, like, you know, in the nature of my work is that I'm free to, um, I'm free to, um, speculate as to the why you know I'm, I'm free to speculate as to the why beyond data into you know into um ideas about the personhood of the bacteria um i think i think one of the things i come to all the time uh with this this work is what i've what i've come to is that one can ascribe personhood without ascribing human motive um, and I think it's one of the hardest things to to do as a person is to say, this thing this thing thinks. It thinks in a way I could never comprehend. There's a great, um, I was reading a really wonderful book about consciousness. Um, the, I think the title of it is something to, along the lines of the origin of consciousness. Uh, talking about the sort of apparent consciousness of octopi, uh, octopuses. And, um, and the, one of the things that there was a quote in it from from another author who said, you know, the thing is that even if a lion could speak, uh, could speak in human language, 
you wouldn't understand a thing that thing was saying to you. Um, be, uh, this, that was a very, very crass way of paraphrasing it. Um, but uh, you know, it said if a lion could speak, you wouldn't understand what it was saying. Um, and and I think that the 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 idea there is that it isn't that the lion can't speak. It's that the the ideas of the being are so different from our own that in order to in order to understand why it would say the things that it says or to ascribe meaning to what it would say, we would have to engage in a profound act of of transcendence. We would have to say, I am not I, I am not going to think as me for the moment. I'm going to think as as the lion or I'm going to think as the bacteria. Um, and so what I find is that what I find is that um, I don't know what the things around me are trying to say, but oftentimes if I shut up and listen, um, I, I get the feeling that I can understand them a little bit better, that they, that it's not that they'll, that's not that they don't speak or that they don't give meaning. It's that I, I've just not learned how to listen in the right way. And when I pause and I listen, um, creatures from the macroverse and the microverse um, seem to seem to to tell you what their actions are for in 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 ways that are in some ways quite obvious sometimes I know why the bacteria ran from the thing that was larger than it it was afraid it was going to die um, and sometimes that means that their motives are are simpler you know or their motives are not a complex I, I don't know that I don't know that I would think for example that the bacteria sits and contemplates its own existence for you know for for periods of time or that it thinks to itself oh if i but had hands to write poetry with um i don't think it would have much use for that um i think uh i think it 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 more more than likely thinks in in a way that that isn't isn't within our own our own our own perspective our own way of thinking uh and so for example i mean just today though i found i found myself uh being talked at by a robin I was watering my garden just before just before this, and found that one of the robins was uh, from our neighborhood was on the ground uh, tweeting, um, and it it was looking at me and tweeting, and it was sort of unmistakable. The robin was talking at me, um, it, and I I'm reasonably sure that it was seeing me water the garden, saw that there were going to be worms very soon, um, and uh, and you know. <laughs> was was talking to me about that. I have no idea exactly what it was saying about that, but that it was speaking to me about that. Um, and I've had experiences with, I've had experiences, yeah, watching, watching other creatures that, um, that I'm always loath to, I'm loath to, I'm loath to anthropomorphize, not because I don't think the creatures have, have minds, but I'm loath to anthropomorphize because I think it's sort of, sort of my responsibility as a human being to instead of anthropomorphize morph my own thinking towards theirs you know to say okay let me try to understand let me try to decenter my own thinking rather than ascribing your mo you know my motives to you let me see if i can understand your motives further from my own perspective there's a really long answer to that question but the short answer is i spend a huge amount of time thinking about the consciousness of other creatures yeah yeah, I think one one fun thing to do would be a special session on uh, microorganism behavior. I mean, there is a lot of work that we do in our lab trying to, you know, decipher what are organisms thinking. And in mm -hmm. the physics world, there has literally been a renaissance on quantifying behavior. So this is the last five years have just been so incredible and so rich in mathematical language is how much can you learn about an organism by just watching and what is the fundamental limit of how much information hey, much you, hey. you have to pay a hundred dollars they're playing play. monopoly uh, <laughs> <laughs> what we will do is uh, we will continue yeah. you, Don't laugh at this. nobody's laughing at you with the yeah you burp you burp we're laughing with you yes Funny. Matt is funny. Uh, okay, so on that note, we'll kind of say bye to everybody. Okay. Thanks for joining. I'm going to record this and send you the link, Christine. Uh, this has become almost like a Saturday ritual, so let's continue these. And sorry again, Matt, for confusions on technology. Eventually, we got to figure these things out. <laughs> I'm glad it worked out in a way that we could talk 
you know, talk to uh, talk to people. And I'm actually really glad, like, I, the, the upshot of this is that I get to chat with you for the first time in person. So that's yeah, really nice. Yeah. And, you know, the YouTube, the challenge is it's kind of almost impersonal. I think this is the way to do it. Awesome. Uh, okay, on that note, we'll say bye. Uh, bye, everybody. Have a good 4th of July. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Bye. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Bye.